Αξιότιμε κύριε Αντιπρίτανη του Εθνικού και Καποδιστριακού Πανεπιστημίου Αθηνών. Αξιότιμε κύριε Κοσμήτορα της Σχολής Επιστημών Υγείας. Αξιότιμε κύριε Πρόεδρε του Τμήματος Φαρμακευτικής. Η κυρία Υπουργό δεν έχει έρθει ακόμα, αλλά την περιμένουμε. Ε, καθώς επίσης και τον πρόεδρο του ε, Εθνικού Οργανισμού Φαρμάκων, ο οποίος είναι στο δρόμο, έχει σήμερα πάρα πολύ κίνηση από ό,τι έχω ακούσει στην Αθήνα και γι' αυτό έχουν καθυστερήσει. Ε, να καλωσορίσω και τους ε, αγαπητούς χορηγούς, βεβαίως, ε, και τους διακεκριμένους προσκεκλημένους που έχουμε εδώ, Αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, βεβαίως αγαπητοί φοιτητές που είσαστε εδώ σε μεγάλο αριθμό και χαίρομαι πάρα πολύ γιατί είναι πολύ σημαντικό να έρχεστε σε τέτοιες εκδηλώσεις που ε, βλέπετε πράγματα τα οποία ε, δεν θα τα δείτε κατά τη διάρκεια των σπουδών σας αλλά μόνο στα συνέδρια μπορείτε να δείτε τέτοιες ωραίες ε, ε, ομιλίες και τόσους ε, σημαντικούς ανθρώπους ταυτόχρονα. Κυρίε και κύριοι, είναι μεγάλη μου χαρά να σα καλωσορίσω στην τελετή έναρξη του 4ου Διεθνού Συνεδρίου Φαρμακογονιδιωματική και Εξατομικευμένη Διάγνωση και Θεραπεία. Συγκεντρωθήκαμε σήμερα εδώ από διάφορα μέρη του κόσμου για να συζητήσουμε και να μοιραστούμε τι γνώσει και τι εμπειρίε μα στον εξαιρετικά επίκαιρο τομέα τη ιατρική ακριβία. Η ιατρική ακριβία υπόσχεται αποτελεσματικότερε στοχευμένες θεραπείες για τους ασθενείς μας με βάση το μοναδικό γενετικό τους προφίλ, τον τρόπο ζωής τους, αλλά και το περιβάλλον στο οποίο ζουν. Οι δυνατότητες της ιατρικής ακριβίας να μεταμορφώσουν την παροχή υγειονομικής περίθαλψης είναι τεράστιες και είμαστε ήδη μάρτυρες μιας εντυπωσιακή ενίσχυσης της έρευνας και της ανάπτυξης στο πεδίο αυτό. Το συνέδριο αποτελεί μια εξαιρετική ευκαιρία για τους ειδικού, τους ερευνητές, τους εμπλεκόμενους φορείς γενικότερα να συναντηθούν και να μοιραστούν τις απόψεις τους σχετικά με τις τελευταίες εξελίξεις στην ιατρική ε, ακριβία. Τις επόμενες τρεις ημέρες θα έχουμε την ευκαιρία για επικοδομητικές συζητήσεις, να ανταλλάξουμε ιδέες και γνώσεις και να διερευνήσουμε πιθανές ευκαιρίες για συνεργασίες. Βέβαια, προτεραιότητα οφείλουμε να δώσουμε στην ίση μεταχείριση και τη συμπερίληψη και να εργαστούμε προς αυτή την κατεύθυνση της άρσης των όποιων εμποδίων στην πρόσβαση στην εξατομικευμένη υγειονομική περίθαλψη. Αυτό απαιτεί συνεργασία, διεπιστημονική, διατομεακή, με τους παρόχους υγειονομικής περίθαλψης, τους φορείς χάλαξης πολιτικής, της υγείας, τους ερευνητές, αλλά και τους υποστηρικτικούς συλλόγους των ασθενών. Μην ξεχνάμε τους ασθενείς, για αυτούς είμαστε εδώ. Επίσης, θα πρέπει να διασφαλίσουμε ότι οι ασθενείς μας ενημερώνονται και εκπαιδεύονται σχετικά με την ιατρική ακριβία, ώστε να έχουν τη δυνατότητα να λαμβάνουν αποφάσεις για την εξατομικευμένη υγειονομική τους περίθαλψη. Αυτό περιλαμβάνει βέβαια ζητήματα ηθικής, της προστασίας της ιδιωτικότητας, της προστασίας των προσωπικών δεδομένων, στα οποία πρέπει πάντα να δίνεται ιδιαίτερη προσοχή. Καθώς συνεχίζουμε να αναπτύσσουμε την ιατρική ακριβία, ας επικεντρωθούμε στον ασθενή, και ας εργαστούμε για ένα μέλλον όπου όλοι θα έχουν πρόσβαση σε εξατομικευμένη υψηλής ποιότητας υγειονομική περίθαλψη. Θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω την Οργανωτική Επιτροπή του Συνεδρίου, την Επιστημονική Επιτροπή, τους χορηγούς μας και βέβαια τους ομιλητές. Η συμβολή όλων είναι καθοριστική. Ευχαριστώ και όλους εσάς που είστε εδώ σήμερα για να παρακολουθήσετε τις εργασίες του Συνεδρίου, καθώς και όλους που παρακολουθούν το Συνέδριο από το Διαδίκτυο. Εύχομαι να έχουμε μια γόνιμη αλληλεπίδραση τις τρεις ημέρες και ανυπομονώ να συμμετάσχω και εγώ μαζί σας σε επικοδομητικές συζητήσεις. 
Dear Mr. Vice President, Vice Rector of the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, Dear Mr. Dean of the School of Health Sciences, Dear Mr. President of the Department of Pharmacy, Dear Mrs. Minister, Dear Mr. President of the National Organization for Medicines, Dear Sponsors, Dear Distinguished Guests, Dear Colleagues, Dear Students, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the opening ceremony of the 4th International Congress of Pharmacogenomics and Personalized Diagnosis and Therapy. We have gathered here today from various parts of the world to discuss and share our knowledge and experiences in the existing field of uh, precision medicine. Precision medicine offers the promise for more effective treatments to our patients based to their unique genetic makeup as well as their lifestyle and the environment. The potential of precision medicine to revolutionize healthcare delivery is immense and we are fortunate to witness a vast boost in the research and development in this area. This Congress is an excellent opportunity for experts, researchers, and stakeholders to come together and share their insights on the latest advances in precision medicine. Over the next three days, we will have stimulating discussions. We will experience and exchange ideas and knowledge, and we will explore opportunities for collaboration. However, we should prioritize equity and inclusion and work towards removing barriers to accessing personal, personalized healthcare. This requires collaboration across various sectors, including healthcare providers, policymakers, researchers, and patient advocates. We should also ensure that patients are informed and educated about precision medicine and uh, that they are empowered to make informed decisions about their health care. This includes, of course, consideration of privacy, data protection, and ethical concerns. As we continue to advance precision medicine, let us keep on, uh, our focus on the patient and work towards a future where everyone has access to personalized, high-quality healthcare. I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee of the conference, the scientific committee, our sponsors, and of course, the speakers. The contribution of all of you is uh, crucial. I would also like to thank all of you who have uh, made it to come here today to attend the conference proceedings, as well as those who follow the conference online. I hope we will have a fruitful interaction over the three days, and I look forward to engaging with you in meaningful discussions. Thank you very much. The next opening speech will be given uh, from Dr. Estathos Estathopoulos, who is the, va who is the, rector, uh, the vice rector of uh, National Capodistrian uh, University of Athens, and he's a professor of medical and radiation physics. Uh, dear members of the organizing committee, Dear members of the scientific committee of this Congress, esteemed prof professors and participants, honorable friends and colleagues, and dear students, on behalf of the National and Capodistrian University of Athens, I cordially welcome you to the opening of the fourth International Congress of Pharmacogenomics and Personalized Diagnosis and Therapy which takes place under the auspices of our university 
uh, pharmacy department. Although we may all be aware of the term precision medicine, which is becoming more and more popular nowadays, allow me to use the words of the Canadian physician William Osler, who said it's more important to know what kind of a patient the disease has than to know what kind of a disease the patient has. So although the holistic approach is, is described in almost all guidelines for the treatment of most diseases, including cancer, cardiovascular, Alzheimer's, diabetes, infections, dermatitis, endometritis, etc., we, as scientists, do not always give it the attention it deserves, while several diseases underline the importance of initiatives undertaken by all of us so that the precision medicine will achieve its, its goal, and that is to improve accuracy in medical decisions and health recommendations. We are also aware of the fact that the huge amount of genomic data offered to us is not immediately applicable in uh, clinical practice, and uh, that's exactly where personalized medicine takes advantage of this data. To define medical models that are useful to tailor the right therapeutic strategy to the right patient at the right time. Indeed, there is much more to be accomplished if we increase the level of our scientific cooperation. We can further develop innovative solutions uh, along uh, with the use of AI, the artificial intelligence, and we can train our societies, we can train our patients to adapt to this new approach. These challenges are likely to be even more apparent in low-income and middle-income social-level patients that need to be considered. In my opinion, we as scientists, doctors and academic teachers should undertake to implement more extravagant policies facilitating our societies to adapt to the challenges of this new era. Let's all bring new knowledge in this Congress and let's all share our concerns, always aiming for the well-being of our patients. Thank you very much and welcome to the Congress. Uh, the next opening speech, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Emmanuel Picoulis, who is uh, a professor of surgery at the National Akaporodisia University of Athens, and he's also the dean of the School of Health Sciences. Καλημέρα σας. Να σας καλωσορίσω και εγώ και να συγχαρώ τους διοργανωτές και ιδιαίτερα τον αγαπητό καθηγητή Νικόλαο Δρακούλη για αυτή την επιστημονική εκδήλωση. Το Τμήμα Φαρμακευτικής, μια από τις 100 καλύτερες σχολές του κόσμου, αποτελεί μια σχολή υπόδειγμα για το συνδυασμό εκπαίδευσης και έρευνας. Σε μια περίοδο που η έννοια και η πρακτική υλοποίηση μοντέλων ιατρικής ακρίβειας αποτελούν πλέον μονόδρομο και για να υλοποιηθούν προϋποθέτουν διεπιστημονικές συνεργασίες. Ο επιστημονικός διάλογος ανάμεσα σε ερευνητέ κλινικούς και εργαστηριακούς ιατρούς και εμπειρογνώμονες είναι προαπαιτούμενο. Για το λόγο αυτό και η συζήτηση σε θέματα που αγγίζουν την ευρωλογία, την αντιμετώπιση λοιμόξεων, τη δερματολογία, τη γυναικολογία, τις καρδιαγκιακές παθήσεις, είναι ιδιαίτερα σημαντική. Να ευχηθώ λοιπόν καλή επιτυχία στο συνέδριό σας. Ευχαριστώ. I have a problem with the microphone. Uh, the next speech will be, will be given from uh, Dr. Christos Repar, who is the professor of pharmaceutics, and uh, he is also the chairman of School of Pharmacy. Uh, on behalf of all employees of the Department of Pharmacy, I would like to welcome you all 
to the Fourth International Congress of Pharmacogenomics and Personalized Diagnosis and Therapy, Precision Medicine in Disease Diagnosis and Therapy 2023. We are honored to host relevant activities at the premises of the Department of Pharmacy. I would like to congratulate Professor Nikolos Drakoulis and the members of the organizing and scientific committees for putting together an exciting program suggesting state-of-art presentations and in-depth discussions. I wish you all a productive week and those who have traveled to Athens to enjoy their stay. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to invite Dr. Gaga. She is uh, Mrs. Minister of uh, Health in Greece, and she, she is also director of the first pulmonology clinic in Igia Hospital. Okay. So, Anixi. Για ανάγνωση το θέλουμε. Για ανάγνωση το θέλουμε. Δεν μας πει. So, good morning. Καλημέρα σε όλους. Δώστε μου ένα λεπτό να ανοίξει ο φάκελος. Καταρχήν, να ευχαριστήσω πάρα πολύ τον κύριο Δρακούλη και όλους εσάς, για την πρόσκληση καταρχήν τον κύριο Δρακούλη και όλους εσάς που είστε εδώ σήμερα. Θα μιλήσω αγγλικά, γιατί αυτό μου ζητήθηκε. So, again, good morning, everyone. What I would like to do is give you an overall view of the health systems and what the patients need, but also what the healthcare workers need and what everyone, every citizen needs in healthcare today. And I'm not going to go into pharmacogenomics or um, targeted treatment per se, because there are a lot of people in this audience who will talk about it. What I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about with two hats, as a doctor, as a pulmonologist, seeing on a daily basis patients with lung cancer or cystic fibrosis or diffuse lung disease who need personalized care. But also as a policymaker, because I've been involved in advocacy and policy making for a number of years through the presidency of the European Respiratory Society and um, the, um, the, the, my short term at the Ministry of Health in Greece. So the, the the topic today is targeted and sustainable healthcare opportunities and challenges for patients and health systems. I have to sure. direct it somewhere or okay. So first of all, what do we need in healthcare? First of all, what do patients need? But also, what do healthcare workers need? What do healthcare personnel need? Because they are the providers of healthcare. And also, what people need? The children who will grow up and have needs, the adults, also the elderly, and we're becoming more and more old as time goes, and the frail. The first thing we need is a net of security around us, feeling safe, feeling secure, or that whatever happens, whatever arrives, it will be dealt with. And to have this, we need people around us. We need somebody smiling at us and saying, I'm here for you. So first of all, we need to build confidence in the systems. And how is this built? First of all, there's respect for the patient. The patient needs to feel respected as a person and needs to be treated like with respect and the ability to solve his problems or her problems. We need competent health systems with good quality outcomes and we need the systems to be both accessible and affordable to patients. How do we do that? Is it about funding? Is it about how much we spend? I'm going to show you some data. I'm sorry. 
So this is from Statista, and it shows you how much countries spend on healthcare. The winner here is the United States. They spend around 17, 18% of their gross GDP, which is quite high, by the way, on healthcare. There are many European countries which spend allow, uh, around 10, 12% of their GDP, and there are countries that are quite affluent, so with a quite, quite high GDP. There are countries which spend a lot less, like Israel, for example, which is down here, and they spend around um, 7%, but still they have a great health system. And there are countries like Ethiopia and India, which have both a low GDP and spend very little on health healthcare, 3, 3% for India. Again, this for some reason doesn't work. I'm going to show you some data from the Quest study, which is run by Professor Margaret Crook at Harvard in collaboration with the WHO about how f people feel about their health systems. And what we, they, they have been asked, this is a study that has also, the, uh, a survey that has been also performed in Greece. I won't show you the Greek data. First of all, is there confidence in the system? How do people feel? And you can see the countries here. What I can tell you is that half of the respondents respond, respond that they can get and they can afford healthcare if they get sick tomorrow suddenly. The highest trust in the system is in Mexico, Italy, India, and Laos. The lowest is in Peru, Colombia, Uruguay, and Argentina. And in every system, affordability is worse than getting good care. So people think that they can get good care. Sometimes they, they're not sure that they can afford it. And this is how the systems are going. Is it, is it, do they feel that it's getting better over time or that it's getting worse over time? And I'm showing you here the majority of respondents in the lowest income countries like Ethiopia, Laos, India, and Kenya think that their systems are going the right way. They get better over time. These are people with low GDP, with fewer expectations in the health system, so they're happy with every little change they see. One third of the respondents agreed in middle income countries um, that things are going okay, like Argentina, Mexico, Peru, and Colombia, but the lowest ratings were in Italy, in the United States, and United Kingdom, where people spend a lot of money on healthcare, where people also have a lot of healthcare expectations and a lot of expectations. So, healthcare expenditure and how people feel and how much they trust the systems don't go hand in hand. Oh, come on. I think I need some help. Okay. okay. So, what I showed you so far are subjective measures, how people feel. There are also, of course, objective measures to see how health, uh, healthcare systems are doing. One is measuring waiting times. How much time does somebody need for a hip replacement? It can be a week, it can be three years, depending on the healthcare system. What are the adverse events? Do we have a lot of infections? Do we have a lot of adverse events while hospitalized or even when we don't get the care, the, we don't get the care we need? What are the survival rates in diseases that are life-threatening? whether there is the presence of standard operating procedures, and whether there are audits. These are sub objective measures of how the healthcare systems are going. And I'm showing you here a study we did 10 years ago, and this had to do with how people with lung cancer are treated in various European countries. And we found that there were huge differences in waiting times and in access to healthcare. And it wasn't just among countries, from richer to poorer, but it was also within specific areas in each country. And I'm going to talk about it a little more later on. Access is not always a matter of organization. It has to do with geography. For example, in Greece, we have about 200 inhabited islands. Some have 200 people, some have 2,000 people. There's no way that they can get the same type of care next 
door to their home as if they were living in the Athens metropolitan area or if they were living in Luxembourg. So there have, there has, there have to be ways to deal with the geographical content. The same goes for Canada, for example, which in the winter there are villages that become completely inaccessible and people have to be transferred by air transfer. So what we need to, to do is have provide universally access to healthcare, and that has two very important um, goals. One is to be able to have first aid offered everywhere for a, a, a car accident, for example, have a, 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 a peridesis around one leg so that they don't bleed out, or give a first response for a, people who's, for a person who's having a heart attack, and then safe transfer to a bigger hospital or to a bigger center. We also need to take care of chronic problems without patients moving from one place to another, and the newer tools like telemedicine and also multidisciplinary care, which can come through telemedicine, are very important tools. And for example, in our country, we have telemedicine functioning in every um, island, on every island in the Aegean. And we're on the way to do this for also for the Ionian Islands. And of course, once we do that, we can have the patient transferred to a big center or by air transfer or by um, ambulance, depending on where they live. Come on. This is an issue. Was the top of slide? Δεν, πατάω και δεν, πατάω. Συγγνώμη, πατάτε το. Πατάω το επόμενο. Τι θέλετε να πατάω. Οκ, ευχαριστώ. Οκ, I'm showing you here a, a photo from the WHO. Um, this is the WHO European Office Director, Dr. Hans Kluge. This is the healthcare provider of this village, which is about two hours boat ride from the main city in Greenland, from Nuuk. It's a community of about 200 fishermen uh, who live there, and their only care provided is this half part-time part nurse and part-time boat mechanic who can deliver babies, who can give first aid care, who can deal with the problems, chronic problems, um, with the people's chronic problems in collaboration with telemedicine link to a main Copenhagen hospital. So there are ways to deal with them, um, even with people living in remote areas. So what are the current programs of work in the EU? I'm showing you here two um, reports. One is the EU report, which comes out every two years. This is the WHO European Office report, which comes out every five years. What are the core priorities? moving towards universal health coverage for everyone, protecting against healthcare emergencies, and we've seen the problems in the recent years. We've had the pandemic, there was an earthquake, huge earthquake in Turkey and other places, there was a flood in Greece, so there are healthcare emergencies and there may be more. Promote health and well-being, strengthening the resilience of healthcare systems, which we need in the dealing with crisis, promoting better prevention and better treatment, presenting and addressing mental health issues, and mental health will be the next pandemic. We're rising in the number of people with dementia, and they need healthcare and they need support. Um, supporting the digital transformation, which is a huge tool in, of health health systems, and recognizing the importance of regional, national, European, and even broader international efforts to address global health issues. We've seen this during the pandemic. We've had the vaccine in a record time. So, to go back to quality health care systems, what, is a, a health, what, are, what are they here for, the health care systems? They're here for people. They're here to treat people. And a high um, quality health care system optimizes health in any given context. Consistently delivering health care that improves or maintains health is being valued and trusted by the people who use it and responds to the challenges, to the new needs. Prevention is key in every health system because for every euro we spend in prevention, we have a return of about 10 times more in healthcare. 
and that's not just the cost, it's also the, the stress that goes with it, the family issues that go with it. And I'm showing you this very old slide, which is from the London um, Tube, and it's by a professor who examined the, um, healthcare ex the, the life expectancy and linked it to the poverty and the socioeconomic factors in each area. And you see that there, are, there is, for example, along the Jubilee line, there's a 10-year health expectancy gap from the richer areas to the poorer areas. And that's a huge issue. The next, which is what you are mostly interested in here, is research. And research is, of course, key. And we have a lot of things to do with research. First of all, design very good, very well-conducted studies with GDP. We have a lot of um, new technologies, the omics, organoids, um, molecular medicine, and you will hear a lot more about it, I'm sure. There are unmet needs, and unmet needs are particularly in rare diseases and life-threatening diseases, in degenerative diseases like dementia, so we need to invest, we need to design well the studies, and we need to carry out the research in, a, um, in, in the best possible way. And of course, this has a high cost, and it needs to be sustained. What the pharma industry uses and the EU uses recently, uh, lately, is um, real-world data, and this helps us understand how people respond to specific medications or to specific ma changes in healthcare, and it's very helpful. It cuts down the cost. Of course, it's not there for innovative medications and research into new compounds. The EMA has a very um, ambitious um, target of um, using by 2025 real world um, evidence um, to enable better healthcare. And the next thing that comes up is big data and big data analysis is also something that we need. It will help us and we're amazing data at the speed of light. We are analyzing data at the speed of light. It can help us with guidelines, with understanding what's happening. But we need to remember that the problem is that with no set entry criteria into big data, we have a very diverse set of data that are entered into the systems, and then it is very difficult to analyze the data, to compare the studies, to compare the results, and arrive at safe conclusions. And as we say, trash in, trash out. So big data have to be entered in a specific way and be clean. Um, and the last thing I wanted to talk about is the patient voice. So to provide good and targeted healthcare, we need to know the patient. And that doesn't mean knowing the genetics of the patient, knowing whether the patient has a BRCA positive background or a TKI um, or is able to receive TKI. It has to do also with who the patient is, what their needs are, what their expectations are. And I'll give you just one example. We had at uh, the beginning of the TKI era, we had a patient who was a very good candidate for this medication and we told him he could have it, it was a pill, he didn't have to, um, he would not have any side effects, but he had to be very careful of sunlight. So he should not be exposed in sunlight. He told us, I live for the sunlight. I live to go fishing, to be by the sea. I don't care if I live short, a shorter life, but I want to be able to do the things I like. So targeted medicine, targeted medicine is both about what fits the patient as far as his genetic background, but also what fits the patient in his mentality, in his wishes. These are two great people who are patient um, advocates. This is Dimitris Kondopidis on the um, left. Um, he is the head of the uh, European Lung Foundation and also involved in cystic fibrosis in Greece and in the um, uh, patient association in Greece. He's been very vocal, he's been instrumental in managing to get medications for cystic fibrosis and he manages to, against all odds, when he was born he was told he was going to live until he's about 20-25. He's in his 40s and he's very happy and quite healthy. I used to remember him living with an oxygen, with an oxygen uh, supplementation. He's now without oxygen and he's feeling pretty safe. And on the um, right side is Meryl Henning, a lung cancer patient who also has been instrumental in delivering healthcare, better healthcare, because when we talk to patients and patient advocates, we understand better what we need to do to make them feel better. Um, 
And finally, one important thing is holistic care has to do with a multidisciplinary team, has to do with a psychologist being there, with the physiotherapist being there, but also aesthetics. And I'm showing you photos of cancer patients who, uh, if they receive chemotherapy well into the second month of treatment, they lose their hair, their eyebrows. So it is very important to support them. And there are a lot of um, both the countries, uh, for example, in Belgium, there's um, um, in the... Um, hospital for in Jules Bordet, which is an oncology hospital, there's an aesthetician, a beautician who goes around and sees patients and counsels them. In Greece, we have a lot of non-profit organizations who help people live better, survive better, and also feel better about themselves. So can, how can all of us help? We need to organize healthcare, we need to educate both the people, educate, for example, children when they're six or nine years old that they should avoid smoking, that they should have healthy habits for eating and exercise. We need to educate and keep educating healthcare personnel. And we need to plan, plan ahead with a long-term care planning and review constantly. So we start with academia, hospitals, and points of care, because that's where most patients will see, but we also need to see schools and teach children and teach the general public. We involve scientific societies, we involve politicians, ministries at national, European, or even world level. We talk to industry, we talk to pharma, we talk to insurance agencies because they will pay the bill most of the time. We talk to patients and see what they need and what they request from us. We talk to the press because they are the people who will deliver the knowledge and the mentality, if you want, as well, to the general public. And one great achievement of the EU is the European Reference Networks, because this is particularly important for rare diseases. As a clinician, I can see a patient with rare disease once in my life, maybe 10 times in my life, but if we link 100 centers across Europe, then we end up with 1,000 patients per year, and then we can do studies for new compounds, we can have better experience and treat our patients and manage our patients better, or diagnose our patients better. So targeted and sustainable health, is it about the money? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I've shown you already some data on finances. First of all, it has to do with resources, and resources are people, it's funding, and it's organization. People, we have a huge problem with healthcare personnel because with the pandemic there's been a huge burnout. So a lot of people left health systems worldwide. In the US alone there are about 300,000 people who left. We have a lot of nurses and medics, maybe more than we had previously, but the needs are more than we had previously. First of all, because the life expectancy is becoming longer and longer. So people have a lot of health problems and they need to be taken care of. Uh, one very good way, so we, we need to attract new people to healthcare, and I remind you, you know it all, that healthcare m means that there will be sometimes no weekends, that there will be night shifts, that there's a price to pay for everybody working in healthcare, and this is something that you should do, and you know what to do it, but it is also a calling, so we have to attract people at a very young age into healthcare. We need to educate them and constantly update this personnel, and we need to build a culture of solidarity and social conscience. Then we have to build networks of care, because talking to other people and managing patients with um, talking to other healthcare workers who have more experience helps the patients and help the healthcare personnel. We, we should, of course, use the technology, AI algorithms for the diagnosis, for um, imaging. We should use also the algorithms for, t for treatment. We have telemedicine, which is a huge tool, remote counseling, multidisciplinary care, and supportive care, always given by this team of um, healthcare workers who are multidisciplinary. And also we have to build and promote networks for research because the collaboration of academics, clinicians, and the industry to promote research for cutting edge, new medications and new technologies to meet the unmet needs of people is mandatory and we need to com uh, evaluate constantly. So what is needed, and I'm finishing, to work together for the prevention and patient-centered quality care that must respond to the people's needs. It is state-of-the-art, but it is also affordable for the patients. 
respect and support the patient, his family, and also the healthcare workers. Collaboration in teamworks with concern for the patient and concern for the workers as well. Keep observing and testing, that's very important in science and in medicine, and focus on problem solving and the evolution. We do still have many unanswered questions and many unanswered needs. Uh, health, um, dementia, cancer, rare diseases, just to mention a few. So new insights and solutions require that clinicians, scientists, bioethicists often work together and collaborate with patient representatives, with um, policy regulators, with politicians and health economists to provide safe, effective and sustainable outcomes in healthcare. And until we have all that, a smile and being there for the patient goes a long way. Thank you. Mrs. Minister, thank you very much for this stunning presentation. The next speaker uh, is Dr. Evangelos Vanolopoulos. He's a pharmacologist, and now he is the president of National Organization for Medicine in Greece. Παρακαλώ, επιτρέψτε μου να πω κάτι στα ελληνικά, γιατί έχει να κάνει με την ελληνική πραγματικότητα. Ω επιστήμονα που ασχολούμαι με τη φαρμακογνωδιωματική και τη στοχευμένη θεραπεία, θεωρώ ότι είναι μια πολύ μεγάλη στιγμή για την Ελλάδα να έχουμε πρόεδρο στον Εθνικό Οργανισμό Φαρμάκων, έναν άνθρωπο που έχει αφιερωθεί στη στοχευμένη θεραπεία. Κάτι που για την Ελλάδα ακόμα είναι πολύ άγνωστο και μακάρι να μπορέσουμε να το προωθήσουμε. Okay, thank you. Am I, gonna, am I supposed to speak in English or in Greek or both? Uh, I will continue as uh, Dr. Gaga has started. And uh, I should start by saying that it's an honor and pleasure to follow Dr. Gaga on, uh, on the podium, which made us all proud with her time at the ministry the previous two years. And um, of course, I should congratulate and thank uh, Professor Draculis for the invitation. He's one of the first people who have practiced pharmacogenomics in Greece and actually already in Germany 30 years ago. And uh, me, myself, I have, uh, th that's my major, my main field of research, pharmacogenomics. Actually, originally I was supposed to speak in this Congress with Nikos, we had arranged it already back in September. It would be on Sunday and talk about pharmacogenomics of anticoagulant drugs, which is a topic uh, I do research upon on the uh, last 10 years. Well, th there's been change. I've been uh, appointed at the National Medicines Organization two weeks ago, so I changed hats and came in as a president and uh, now being extremely busy in that new post, learning all the tricks and all the ropes there and how it works. I will just, I said I can come just to say a few words and congratulate you and uh, get this chance to communicate with um, the young people in pharmacy school. Actually, I'm a professor at a medical school. Now, uh, being at the National Drug Organization, I have to deal daily with pharmacists. So I urge all of you uh, to consider a career at the drug uh, organization of Greece. Not everybody has to be a private owner of pharmacy. I'm sure some of you will choose scientific careers and uh, some of you will choose to help in all the efforts of the government and the state to control, regulate, and secure better, safer medicines for everybody, which is the, the motto we all uh, work upon, the goal. And of course, I should say a few words about personalized medicine and uh, pharmacogenomics and omics, which is the future, together with artificial intelligence and uh, bioinformatics. Uh, I'm sure they will change the landscape of uh, therapy, also regarding drugs, drugs not only, of course, for disease prevention and uh, therapy, but also in drugs, there's a lot expected from these new technologies. Uh, 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 to be true, pharmacogenomics is not anymore a new technology. Pharmacogenomics is out there already from early 21st century. It's been applied in many occasions, so and pharmacists have a major role to play. Many, you may hear many clinicians saying, well, pharmacogenomics is still something coming, but I assure you, in many places, in, uh, I had the, just the chance to talk with somebody from Mayo Clinic, who has been Mayo Clinic. Mayo Clinic has been a primary location for developing pharmacogenomics, running clinical studies, establishing concepts, and uh, 
A lot of them now have been, uh, are in practice and are used in many hospitals. Not very much in Greece, uh, Nikos, unfortunately. It's our duty and our responsibility to help expand pharmacogenomics in the country. And I'm sure Congresses like this will uh, educate and convince the next gen the new generation of scientists that will be involved in pharmacogenomics and personalized medicine with a little broader concept, but uh, well, at, in the end, at the end of the day, we all aim at better therapy for our patients. Now, I, I don't have any slides. I will not uh, expand very much. Uh, please enjoy the rest of the meeting. Thank you again for the invitation and hope to see you the next meeting with a real lecture on <laughs> the topics of my interest. Thank you. The next speech will be given from uh, Professor Dimitrios Padidos. He's a very known Greek virologist. Uh, he's a married professor of the University of Crete, and uh, now he is a founder of Padidos Publications. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Nikos Rakoulis for the invitation uh, to talk to this uh, conference. Uh, my talk will be divided in two parts. The first, I'll talk a little bit about cancer, and the second part about publishing in biomedical sciences. Uh, oh, maybe here. Not working. Maybe the battery is on. Ah, okay, I can use this one. That's it. Okay, fine. Uh, as you know, cancer is a very common disease. Two out of five people will develop in their lifetime cancer, and one in five will die of cancer. Uh, so, uh, I thought uh, about half a century ago, about 47 years ago, that uh, it would be important to identify cancer genes. And uh, if cancer genes act dominantly, it might be a way to do that by finding a selective method that allows us to identify these genes. So using appropriate uh, uh, methodological uh, techniques, and uh, this ideological approach, I uh, first trying to transfer uh, metaphase chromosomes and uh, cellular DNA uh, from cancer cells into normal cells. This is a very rare event. It occurs uh, in one in a million times. So selection procedure is very, uh, uh, is very meticulous and very, uh, very low uh, happening. Now, this was uh, done, as I said, about uh, nearly 47 years ago, and it was published in Cell in 1977 and in Nature in 1978. Since that time, others, namely Robert Weinberg from MIT, uh, uh, Cooper uh, from Harvard and um, Barbasin from NIH and uh, also Chris Marshall from London, they tried to repeat these experiments uh, using the same ideological and methodological approach that I had uh, used. Uh, it turned out that uh, they all, uh, these groups, uh, isolated the first human oncogene the Harvey RAS for the first case, the Kirsten RAS, and the N RAS in the London group, who had used actually the same uh, tumor cell line that I used in my experiments. Uh, so immediately then, uh, it turned out 
that cancer was a genetic disease because it was found out that a single point mutation in all three members of the Rush family genes, it was enough to convert the proto-oncogene into an oncogene. Uh, uh, subsequent to that, it was then uh, also uh, isolated other uh, oncogenes like the force, June, MIC, uh, CIS, and so forth. And, and, uh, later on, also they were found other competing to the oncogenes, the so-called tumor suppressor genes or oncosuppressor genes. And these ones, also a single point mutation was necessary for inactivating these genes. So it was then obvious that uh, what is important is uh, this uh, mutation that caused uh, uh, cancer. What is important is what we eat, uh, what we drink, uh, what uh, radiation we received, what air we breathe, uh, where the carcinogens are present, and then can uh, cause the mutations in those particular genes. So that was then, this was considered the discovery of oncogenes as it has been described as the most important discovery of the 20th century. Uh, so it was then, uh, uh, we continue studying with the several of my colleagues later on, several of these genes. Uh, we published a lot of work on RAS, MIG, FOS, June, CIS, uh, and the tumor suppressor genes like uh, the P53, the retinoblastoma, and other uh, such uh, genes. Now, a few years later, it became it's obvious to me that uh, oncogenes were not enough, uh, that is the mutation was, in, uh, was not enough to cause cancer. Uh, it was something else that was needed in most of the cases. So I proposed uh, 37 years ago in 1986 when I was working at the Bitson Institute for Cancer Research in Glasgow in Great Britain, a model uh, for cancer development, I called the Unifying Theory for the Development of Cancer. And uh, this, uh, uh, I, what I proposed there, that there were not only the genetic changes, but were also epigenetic changes which are important in order to complete uh, uh, the cancer process. Cancer is a multi-step or multi-stage process of carcinogenesis. And uh, although in some cases, like the retinoblastoma gene, the retinoblastoma, where only two mutations are required in the two alleles uh, to have the retinoblastoma tumor in the eye, uh, uh, which is retinoblastoma is an oncosuppressor gene, is a recessive uh, gene. Uh, in some other cases, like in colon or in breast or in lung cancer, you require many more steps. In some cases, uh, five, six, or seven steps before we can complete the, uh, trans the transformation of the normal to the cancer cell. Now, uh, just a couple of days ago, you see that uh, uh, in... Uh, a very important uh, uh, journal in, uh, published in, uh, in Britain, the Scientist Daily, uh, that epigenetic changes drive cancer. An analysis of, of almost 700 different tumors revealed that DNA methylation drives tumorigenesis just like genetic mutations do. So that's what we know now. Of course, uh, we can see below there uh, with some of my students, uh, like uh, Nikos Sulidzis in the first paper, and uh, Stavros Sifakis, Urania Kukura in the second paper. Uh, we published in uh, 2006, 2006, and 2014 that the methylation and other uh, processes like the acylations, uh, which are epigenetically cause uh, uh, activation of oncogenes uh, about uh, uh, the involvement that now everybody recognizes that uh, epigenetic events like methylation, deacylation, uh, uh, differentiation, we know now obesity, I might say, uh, because as you'll see later on, uh, what's the role of that is in, are involved in cancer. So uh, when they talk about uh, uh, curing cancer, uh, 
It's very funny because cancer is at least 200 different clinical forms of cancer. And in most of the cases, we have many, many uh, uh, oncogenes, tumor suppressor genes, epigenetic events involved that makes it very complicated and won't be a single cure for cancer. So recently, with uh, two other colleagues of mine, uh, Dr. Uh, Ioannis Lebesis, uh, Vasiliki Georgakopoulou, Petros Papalexis, uh, uh, Professor uh, Russos, who is the, uh, most uh, famous for his uh, work on, uh, on stress, we shown that stress, uh, also hypothesized that stress is also involved in cancer. We know, for example, that uh, as an epigenetic event, uh, because we know, for example, that uh, stress can induce uh, obesity. Obesity uh, can induce cancer. 10% of the obese pe uh, pe people uh, develop more frequently cancer. Now, uh, that's about the first part. I'll then talk about publishing in biomedical sciences. Before that, maybe I should mention that uh, just to point out, I saw one of colleague of mine here, uh, Alexis Halasos, who was the first who established uh, PCR techniques in uh, in uh, in Greece about 30 years ago. Halasos was um, a medical doctor who came from Paris to my lab in the National Hellenic Research Foundation in Athens. At that time, we were working on viruses and oncogenes, and was the first who established the PCR technique in Greece in the hepatitis B viruses we published. And then we, of course, uh, 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 transferred these techniques to papilloma virus detection. We were the first to describe uh, by PCR papilloma viruses in, in Greece and study them and found that out of 100 or more uh, papilloma viruses that exist, uh, oncogenic are only four. Uh, seven, uh, 16, 18, 31, 33, and the most oncogenic 18, HPV 18, is more frequent in, in Mediterranean countries like Greece. And this explains why a cervical cancer is more frequently in Mediterranean countries than in northern uh, European countries. Just make things uh, uh, straight and give credit to the people who've done some of the work. Now, uh, what I said is uh, 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 that uh, what is important is to publish your results, and uh, more important is to publish in journals that are included in uh, many uh, bibliographic services. And I show here uh, a list of them. The most important is the Science Citation Index, because this is uh, uh, derives uh, from that are derived the impact factors. Uh, next is the Medline, because for the medical doctors they are using it is in the American database that uh, all the uh, medically oriented journals uh, uh, are listed in that uh, database, and so many others uh, are listed here, and uh, many more exist now uh, a days. Now, uh, uh, the reasons I would uh, like to say why uh, manuscripts are rejected, to summarize here for the young scientists, uh, first, of poor experimental design and or inadequate investigation, the failure to conform to the targeted journal, the poor English grammar, style, and syntax, the insufficient problem statement, the methods not described in detail, the overinterpretation of results, the inappropriate or incomplete statistics, the unsatisfactory or confusing presentation of data in tables or figures, the conclusions not supported by data, the incomplete, inaccurate, or outdated review of the literature, and author is unwilling to review the manuscript to, the, to address a reviewer's suggestion. Now, uh, today we have, uh, have uh, 12 journals, uh, international journals, uh, all of them in various databases. Uh, the eight of them are in Science Citation Index and have a relatively good impact factor. 
I started that more than 30 years uh, ago in Greece, the time I came from abroad because I thought in order to be competitive and to keep uh, up with uh, what's going on in the world, we need good uh, journals, uh, international meetings, and transfer of uh, technology from uh, abroad to Greece. And that's what I did with more than 100 PhDs that I produced. Some of them are professors in various schools now in Greece and abroad. And more than 1,000 uh, Greek colleagues that I, I was fortunate to have during my career and 1,000 colleagues from abroad. Now, uh, going to the journals, uh, this uh, a couple of years ago we celebrated the 30 years. This I'm holding the first issue of the International Journal of Oncology in the uh, uh, University of Crete. Uh, that has an impact factor of 5.2, a size score in a scope of 11.4, shows that the trend is going upwards. Uh, in the 30 years, you won't see that, but it is uh, papers published from 83 different countries, uh, mostly from the USA, second Japan, third China, and so forth. But uh, of course, now US, uh, China is going to overtake us, uh, we'll see soon. Uh, uh, USA. Now, Oncology Reports is another one, also a, a, a very good journal. It is more than 30 years now. The National Journal of Molecular Medicine has an impact factor of 5.4, side score 10.7, and so forth. I'll go quickly. Uh, molecular Medicine Reports, Experimental Therapeutic Medicine, uh, Oncology Letters, uh, Molecular and Clinical Oncology, uh, biomedical reports, uh, uh, World Academy of Science Journal, and uh, International Journal of Functional Nutrition, Medicine International, and International Journal of Epigenetics. Uh, that's, uh, in this one, editor-in-chief is uh, Professor Hrusos. Now, uh, uh, we have uh, now estimated last year uh, in our side, there were more than uh, 6.8 million scientists from uh, 237 countries got in. Uh, and uh, uh, this is essentially from all countries of the world. If you think that uh, 198 countries are in the United Nations, we have even, uh, uh, even uh, Vatican, which is uh, a tiny country is considered, even from there they've been uh, watching us what uh, we are publishing. Now, uh, in terms of numbers, uh, for the first time last year, China got first. So, above the United States, that also shows the trend. Uh, yesterday I read a book about a uh, Harvard professor uh, who said that uh, uh, the old time all roads uh, lead to Rome. Now he says the future is all roads lead to Beijing. Uh, so, for uh, science, things uh, are also changing very fast. Uh, that's our motto. And then uh, what uh, just to say here is the, what Max Planck had said uh, some years ago, an important scientific innovation rarely makes its way by, by gradually winning over and converting its opponents. What does happen is that its opponents gradually die out and that the growing generation is familiarized with the idea from the beginning. And the last line that was taken four years ago uh, is something that I've written in the cancer story, and this is, of course, open access to everybody. Tens of thousands have uh, downloaded this in our, from our site, is that science is for long-distance runners, and this is from... Uh, related to the first part of this conference that was dedicated to athletics. And here we established the Penelopian run. That was the first uh, uh, running competition uh, on Earth that was done 3,000 3, years ago in Homeric Lacedaemon, Lacedaemon in Pelana. And uh, this were uh, re-established this in 2019 and goes on for the last few years. And this was the competition was when uh, Odysseus won and that was the prize to marry uh, 
Penelope, the first cousin of uh, Helen of Troy. Uh, thank you very much. I'll well, try to be short. If there are any questions, I would uh, be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Uh, now okay. we have a 20-minute uh, break and then uh, come back because we will have exceptional speeches. He is a professor of genetics and medicines and uh, also he has received uh, numerous awards and honors for, for his contribution in genetics. Thank you very much, Professor. The podium is yours. It's our pleasure to hear. Σας ευχαριστώ πολύ για την εισαγωγή. It is my great pleasure and honor to be here. It is fantastic to see all of you in the amphitheater, the, the younger generation, that you will solve a number of big problems in the near future. I uh, will talk to you about the human genome and in health and disease. And I have it in plural because, as you will see, there's not only one human genome, but many. And uh, I'd like to thank first um, Professor uh, uh, Nicolos Rakoulis and the organizing committee for this kind invitation. And uh, I'd like very much to thank the members of our laboratory and the funding agencies that support our research, the Swiss National Science Foundation, the European Union, an institution within the European Union that's called ERC, the American NIH, and five uh, foundations, uh, Ludwig, Gebert, Lejeune, Proviso, and Child Care for their support over the years. First, I tell you what, what kind of scientist is the geneticist. The geneticist is someone who does a matchmaking. It matches genes or other functional genomic elements in the genome, shown here as squares, to circles that, that are all the different myriads of phenotypes that we have as, uh, as human beings. And uh, uh, let's concentrate first on the proteins, protein coding genes in the genome, the 20,000 protein coding genes. And the game is to link the protein coding genes with phenotypes, with disorders or traits. And the game is sometimes very simple because one functional genomic element relates to one particular phenotype or disorder using the variants in the genome. I'll talk to you about this. But the game sometimes is more complex and, and difficult because one functional genomic element is linked to more than one phenotype and vice versa. One phenotype is linked to more than one gene or other functional genomic element. That reminds me of that movie. <clears throat> Have you seen that movie, The Fiddler on, on the Roof? This is probably uh, an old movie, 1971. Um, <clears throat> a very interesting one in which uh, a Jewish father has three daughters, and he wants his daughters to get married, and then, and then he asks the matchmaker, let's say the geneticist, and then one, one, uh, one of his daughters uh, sings that song. I cannot uh, make it to work. I cannot make it to work. Uh, well, the, the lady says, um, uh, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match. The matchmaker is, is, is the old lady that makes, makes the match between the people. And, and, uh, and then she says, look at your book and make me a perfect match. And uh, uh, let's make a transition. Say that the book is the, the genome and you look at uh, who are the people that, uh, that match. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Now, 
the genome, as you, as you know, it, it is a, a very big text of information written with four letters, four building blocks, A, G, C, and T. And uh, the, the, whole, um, the whole genome is pro probably 3.1 billion letters. And uh, in each one of our cells, we have two copies of the genome, one from our fathers and one from our mother, so the total is probably 6.2 or 6.3 billion letters. It is enormous, but it's finite. And because it's finite, we can study it. Um, to give you an idea of how big our genome is, I convinced the, the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics to print for me um, a piece of the genome that is 1.5% of the genome, which is the DNA in one of our chromosomes, the smallest human chromosome, which is chromosome 21. Um, and uh, uh, this book was produced, and uh, you will realize that th th this is only 1.5% of the genome, and in order to write the entire genome of each one of our cells, we need probably 65 or 70 uh, such books to cover the entire genome. Well, I'll show you the book. The letters are written um, in uh, size 7. Uh, when you write in your, in your computer, you use size 12 usually. And uh, it's uh, 1,470 pages and uh, has about 30,000 letters, 30,000 nucleotides per page. And uh, it weighs 4 kilograms, which which is a problem for me when I put it on the plane. It takes a, a, l a lot of weight in the suitcase. Well, the human genome was first uh, completed, take it with a grain of salt, it, it was completed in, in 2002 with uh, a big celebration at the White House. Uh, the president at the time was uh, Bill Clinton, and, and uh, I remember in that uh, big fiesta over there um, that, that we had also the, the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, by, by video conference, and that was the first time that I saw that uh, one can have a remote uh, participation in a meeting without uh, participation in flesh. And um, so the, human, the first human genome was sort of completed. Uh, <clears throat> it took 12 years. The, the money was put on the, the 1st of October, 1990. 150 million from the NIH to, to study the genome, and uh, had several phases, the mapping, the cloning, the sequencing, and then the variation, which is a very important uh, notion when you, you deal with the genome. Of course, all this fiesta was very good for the public, but everybody knew that we, we, have, we had not sequenced the entire genome at the time. There was about 8% that was not sequenced because it was very difficult to be sequenced at the time and because the technology uh, in 2002 it was, it was not uh, appropriate to sequence all the, uh, the repetitive regions of the genome and all the difficult parts. And the difficult parts were the short arms of human chromosome 13, 14, 15, 21, and 22, the large heterochromatic region of chromosome 1, the large heterochromatic region of chromosome 9, and almost all, all the Y chromosome in, in, in males. And that was completed with the new technology, uh, uh, long read sequencing, uh, in the 1st of April 2022, where all the gaps were filled. All the areas that you see here shown uh, by that color in the idealized chromosomes, it was finished, including, including the, chromosome 20, the chromosome Y that I talked to you about. 
So that gave us the size of the genome, uh, the true size, 3.05 uh, uh, billion base pairs, the number of genes, that's uh, almost 20,000 protein coding genes, and the non-protein coding genes, if you add them, is 63,000, and added very important regions, especially the, uh, the ribosomal RNA genes, that uh, they don't produce a protein, they produce only RNA, that's very important for the, for the translation of the uh, RNA to protein. And they are perhaps involved in, in um, um, aging and uh, neurodegenerative disorders. The time will tell. Uh, now, the second important thing is that every time you, you um, do the genetic experiment and you make a child, the child inherits half of the DNA from the father and half of the DNA from the mother. However, the copy mechanism of the paternal genome or maternal genome to the daughter genomes is, is perfect. Well, it is almost perfect. The copy mechanism from one generation to another or from one cell to another is perfect, as I said, but there are mistakes sometimes. What's the error rate? The error rate is about one um, uh, 10 to the minus 8 per nucleotide per generation, which amounts to one error in 100 million letters. And that error rate changes a little bit the DNA from generation to generation and from cell to cell. And if my DNA here was like this when I was a zygote, every time I put this in a division, I add variants, mutations, and then and then as I age, my cells accumulate a lot of variants, and if I uh, do the genetic experiment and produce a child, the, the, usually a child has 60 more variants that they, they were not present in the parents. So that gives us the genetic variability in the genome. We are all members of the Homo sapiens sapiens because we have a human genome in our cells, however, Point, uh, um, uh, we are similar, the, the whole thing of the circle that you see, but we are different in approximately 0.96% from each other. So each one of us has his own personal, private genome shared with nobody else on Earth. The Earth population is not, as, is not that big the eight, 8 billion people that we are now, is not that big to accommodate, by chance, two individuals with the same exact genome. And that variability gives us the differences uh, that we see even in this auditorium, that I can recognize each and every one of you because you and me, we have slightly different genomes. That is a fantastic gift of, of nature, that our genomes is a bit different. It is, it is the gift that gives us the opportunity to evolve as species and to adapt to the, um, ever, uh, the changing environment. Environment changes, sometimes a new virus comes and then, and then uh, the new virus will attack the majority of people, that there will be some rare individuals that are resistant because the genomes is such, has variation. Uh, uh, they are uh, resistant to this virus and they can survive. So the variability of the genome gives us the opportunity to evolve and to adapt. But as everything in life, nothing is free. There's no free lunch in this life. So in other words, we pay a price for this variability. And the price that we pay as species is that sometimes, sometimes the variability that we have is pathogenic, is bad. And it gives us uh, the myriads of genetic disorders and uh, the thousands of disorders of old age that we call common complex phenotypes. So the genomic disorders of early life and late life 
is the price to pay for the potential for evolution and adaptation. And as this um, uh, very famous evolutionary biologist, Theodosius Dobzhansky, uh, wrote in a book in uh, 1973 that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And you can paraphrase this, that uh, 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 nothing in medicine makes sense except in the light of evolution. So the variants that we have in our genome, um, I have them as a, as a cartoon here. Uh, this is a page of my genome, it has 10,000 nucleotides, and each, each highlighted nucleotide here is one of the variants that I have uh, that differs from the, the genome of the reference. And uh, there are very few clearly pathogenic variants, we call them high impact. In other words, you have one of these variants and you develop a very severe genetic disorder. I do not have a genetic disorder of this because this happens to be an autosomal recessive trait, so I need the two copies of this to be sick. So the, the pathogenic are very rare. The predisposing variants, let's call them predisposing variants, are variants that are common in our genome and they predispose us positively or negatively to uh, many genetic disorders, usually of adult age, um, heart defects, um, uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, schizophrenia, manic depressive illness, obesity, you name them. And there's a third category that, uh, let me call them neutral, that are remnants, fossils of evolution, in evolutionary processes in our genome, that they do not predispose us to anything. They are, they're, they're just neutral. And uh, a major question in the next 50 years is to understand what is predisposing and what is neutral in our genome. You may think that uh, this is uh, um, academic, but it's not. And if I, if I can show you this, uh, this video, I was wondering if you can do it, uh, uh, you will see this gentleman You see the gentleman in the field, he, he, he plays football, and then all of a sudden, it drops dead, it collapses. It collapses because he has a genetic disorder called uh, cardiomyopathy, and this cardiomyopathy is due to one letter change in the six billion letters that he has in his genome. Imagine if you see that book and you say, I changed that letter in a position, not only in this book, but in the whole library of our genome, which is 80 times bigger than this. So the genome is very serious matter, and it is now the basis of all, all um, uh, biology and medicine. I show you another disorder, a disorder of predispositions. Uh, you've heard of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we, in our genomes, we have a gene that's called apolipoprotein. Apolipoprotein gene comes in three flavors. It comes in uh, three colors, a uh, blue-blue, red-red, and blue-red. And the red-red is, 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 is quite common in the population. And the red is because in that particular position, there's an arginine in position 112 and an arginine in position 158. And if you have two copies of this, if you inherit this variant from your father and your mother, you uh, have 12 times more risk for Alzheimer's disease in your lifetime. And if you have one copy of this, you inherit one from either from father or the mother, you have four times more probability from the general population to develop that Alzheimer's disease. Because the genome now is known and uh, we can diagnose and read the genome of each one of us, we change the way we think of medicine. And uh, uh, medicine or the, the, the human disorders have two main causes. 
One is the genomic variability, that branch. And the other is the environmental variability, this branch, or the interaction between the two. And I challenge you to find one human disorder or one human trait that is not due to either a genomic variability or environmental variability. That we call genetic medicine, which is medicine based on the genetic variation. Some people used to call it personalized medicine. The term is uh, a bit inaccurate because uh, personalized medicine depends uh, mainly on the zip code where you're born or the amount of your bank account. Some people call it precision medicine. Francis Collins, the director of the NIH, had the ear of President Obama and, uh, and he said to him that we need to call it precision medicine. Of course, that is not accurate either for our days because precision medicine, we always practice precision medicine since Hippocrates. And there are passages in uh, the Hippocratic writings, the group of doctors that lived in uh, Knidos at the, in uh, Kos at the time. And uh, in the books I say that if you are that kind of character, you develop these disorders. If you are that kind of character, you develop other disorders. So the, the precision and, uh, and uh, per personalized medicine, they are old hat in, in the Greek literature. And uh, so it's better, in my view, to call it with a real name, the genomic medicine. What has changed in the last 20 years, 10 years, is the genomic variability, nothing else. And of course, the ability to recognize with the computation biology. So and this is for prediction, for diagnosis, for prognosis, and for treatment, because for treatment, you can do a choice of treatment for some disorders and monitoring of, of, of the treatment. Now, if you give me your DNA today to study it, I can say something medical for a very small portion. What's that portion? It's 0.39%, that, that small piece. Everything else is medically unknown. And I hope that in the next uh, uh, 10 years, uh, we're going to conquer that piece, the other green piece, which is the part of the genome that uh, codes for all the other protein coding genes, not only the 5,190 as of yesterday, but uh, the rest, uh, 14,820 and 10. Uh, that's a major challenge for you. Now, let's, uh, now I give you three vignettes from our laboratory, and if I go over time, uh, you stop me, and I stop at any time. The first is, from all the unknown genes, the majority, we estimated, there are the ones that are recessive genes. A recessive gene is, some, is a gene that needs a, a bad mutation, a high impact variant in both copies, the one that we get from, from the father and the one that we get from the mother. There are mostly rare disorders. They run in, in families in which the parents are normal and the, the, the children uh, suffer. And uh, the majority of the genes that we do not know are recessives. How can I identify recessive genes? It is difficult to identify the recessive genes in Western societies like Europe and uh, uh, North United States, uh, Japan, China, Af uh, Australia, because we do not have big families anymore and we do not practice consanguinity. We don't marry with our relatives, close relatives. <clears throat> so the recessive disorders, you can find them in countries that have lots of children and practice consanguinity. So if you like to have a, a project like this, a mega project like this to compete with the world and, and to enrich the, the gene catalog with uh, the gene disease associations, the matchmaking that we said in the beginning, you need to go to countries that practice consanguinity. The, uh, I looked at the map about five years ago, and uh, this is the belt on earth that practices consanguinity. North Africa, the Arab countries, um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and uh, the Bangladesh, we did not have uh, good data at the time. 5% of the population practices consanguinity. First cousin marriages, 
uncle, niece, or second cousin. The highest country is Pakistan. It has 220 million people, and seven out of 10 marriages are first cousins. So that th this is, excuse me for the word, a gold mine for uh, uh, identifying recessive disorders. So uh, we started a project that we call it the Swiss Pakistani project with uh, seven centers of collection that you see in this country um, with my fantastic colleague, Mohammed Ansar, who now is a faculty member in the University of Lausanne. And uh, we collected families with either intellectual disability, which is easy to diagnose, or blindness, because it's easy to diagnose. And uh, I will not go into details. Here are some uh, photographs of our uh, donors with intellectual disability and, uh, and eye problems. And uh, using the new computational bioinformatic algorithms, including the last one, which is Alpha Missense, I like to put this in your mind because this will change again the, the diagnostics in genetics. Um, <clears throat> it's based on uh, artificial intelligence for the, the protein folding, and uh, that's called Alpha. Um, uh, uh, and then if you put a mutation in one of the amino acids, then uh, this program, Alpha Missense, it gives you the probability of being benign or neutral or uh, uh, very pathogenic for all the possible, all the possible amino acid substitutions in, this, in the human genome. And to make a long story short, in, uh, for 500 uh, cases, we have about 57 new, new genes in a very short period of time. It's, it's, it's a gold mine. So now, <clears throat> because we are in a pharmacogenetics conference, I give you an example of how important it is to identify new genes for disorders. How much time do I have? It's done? I'm done? Okay. I give you this example and then uh, I shut my mouth. So, this is a family that we, we collected from this area here of Pakistan called Kohat. That's 60, 60 kilometers from the border of uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, a very hot area in uh, wars and uh, <clears throat> bad relationships between the people. And here's a family that has this disorder. There are two affected, the boy and the girl. The parents are first cousins. They are carriers of this bad gene. And the two affected individuals, they have two disorders. They have a heart problem, cardiomyopathy, and uh, they are blind. They are born with normal vision, but after a while, at age five, six, seven, they lose their vision. It's a progressive uh, visual impairment because, because the, the retina in the back of the eye gets destroyed. Um, the gene that causes this is a gene with a Kabbalistic name, SLC6A6, it doesn't matter the name, and, and it has a variant, a mutation, that changes a glycine 399 to a valine. And this gene produces a molecule, produces a molecule that is a transporter. It transports something from the outside of, of the membrane of the retina cells and the heart cells to the inside of the cells. And what it transports is taurine. It's an amino acid that you and I um, uh, fabricate in our body, but we need a lot of taurine, so we need to take it from the outside. So this is the taurine transporter. If you drink the high energy drinks, uh, high energy drinks have uh, the Red Bull, for example, has one milligram of taurine, uh, uh, more than you need. So we said that this rare individual, uh, Sachma and her brother, Rifakat, we may think of treating them if we give them taurine. Um, to give you the pathophysiology of the disease, uh, this is a mouse that has uh, SLC6A6 deficiency. The mice are born with uh, normal retinas, and then at one month of age, the retina is destroyed completely. They have nothing. 
So we, um, we use a, a taurin from a, a company in Zurich uh, that fabricated uh, pure taurin for us. And uh, the, the committee for uh, the human ethics, when we did the application to give them taurin, uh, we brought them to, uh, we brought the family to Geneva. They said all oh, this will take at least a year to get the, uh, the permission because we made a mistake of writing in the application that we need to use a drug that's called taurine. And then we changed the language and we said we, we, need a, a, uh, we use a nutritional supplement. And when we put a nutritional supplement, we got a, a permission in one week, the next meeting of the committee. So we gave them taurine. And uh, to make a long story short, two, months uh, two years later, by all measures, the two brothers, the, the brother and sister, the two siblings, did not have any cardiomyopathy at all. Um, I will not show you any, any, any numbers. My colleagues in cardiology can see, can see this. And the boy had a completely destroyed uh, eye, the back of the eye, the retina, so it was not curable. But the daughter, a little Sachma that you see in, in the picture, she was uh, three and a half years old when we saw her, and she, she could see um, light, uh, light and dark. She could see fingers and perhaps some colors. So we gave them taurine. We did all the pharmacodynamics, you can imagine all this. And uh, now I show you, two years later, her back of the retina, the electroretinogram. That's a normal electroretinogram, usually green there, and with a peak in the, in the center. Uh, the center of the eye we see much better. And that's her electroretinogram. It was all blue, all dead, except for a little bit in the center that was alive. And two years later, by, by taurine from the mouth, tablets of pure taurine, the, the retina is much better. Some uh, cones and roads were revived. The center is almost, almost normal in that scale. And she sees six out of 20. In other words, she could go uh, to the market all by herself in an unknown environment. She could uh, read big letters, etc. And all that with uh, tablets of taurine. That's very rare. Perhaps there are I don't know, 4,000 people with SLC 6A6 deficiency on Earth. However, that shows you how important it is to identify the cause of a disorder, to identify the pathophysiological mechanism, and then uh, try to think intelligently of a treatment. And uh, uh, with this, I thank you very much, and uh, I wish you all best of luck. Thank you very much. Ήταν ένα πραγματικό μάθημα γενετική για όσου ήταν σήμερα εδώ, του φοιτητέ τη φαρμακευτική, αλλά και αυτού που βλέπω ότι υπάρχουν ιντερνετικά από το υβριδικό σύστημα. We will proceed with the next speaker. Dr. Κώστας Δεμέτζο is a professor of pharmaceutical technology and nanotechnology at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens. He has also received numerous awards and honors for his scientific contribution in nanotechnology, including the award of the Order of Science of the Academy of Athens.
Okay, hello everybody. Uh, it is great pleasure for me to participate in this Congress. And uh, first I would like to thank uh, the organizers and uh, of course uh, Professor Draculis for inviting me to deliver a lecture on complex nanomedicines and nanovaccines. Uh, at the end of my talk, I will spend a few minutes uh, to, 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 to present uh, two slides uh, regarding art and beauty at nanoscale. Nano is a unit prefix meaning one billionth, and according to Professor Gregoriadis, who wrote the introduction section of my uh, book, uh, nano in Greek uh, means dwarf. Nanotechnology is the engineering and manufacturing of materials at the atomic and molecular scale and refers to structures in one to 100 nanometer in at least one dimension. And the applications of nanotechnology for treatment, diagnosis, monitoring, and control of biological system is referred as nanomedicine. And uh, here in this slide, uh, you can see we can see uh, the scale of particles. Uh, for example, water molecule belongs to molecular scale. Uh, carbon nanotubes or uh, liposomes, lipid nanoparticles, I will show you in the next slides, uh, belong to nanostructures. And uh, viruses and uh, uh, red blood cells belong to uh, microscopic uh, scale. Stephen Hawking has called this century the century of complexity. And in 2021, three scientists received the Nobel Prize in Physics for groundbreaking contributions to our understanding of complex physical systems. And in 2022, the European Academy of Science and Arts organized a conference on causality and uh, complexity, and the questions that uh, have been raised are how shall you define a complex system? What is the relationship between emergence and complexity? And how shall we identify causal relationships in complex systems? Although the first two questions have received a great deal of attention in science and philosophy, the relationship between causation and complexity remains to be understood. What is a complex system? A complex system contains many interdependent constituents which interact non-linearly. And is a system with numerous components and interconnections, interactions or interdependencies which are difficult to describe, understand, predict, manage, design or change. And the study of complex systems is a challenging field and is currently being applied to the study of a small system. What is a small system? According to the literature, a small system is a system which has a size diameter smaller than the range of interactions of the forces acting on the system itself. And now in this uh, uh, slide, I would like to, to share with you the difference between a complicated system and a complex system. A complicated system, like a car engine, is composed of materials that can't self-assemble. On the other hand, a complex system like an ant colony is composed of individuals that can self-assemble. What is the self-assembly process? The self-assembly process is an amazing undiscovered principle of nature and is the driving force for producing complex and functional structures like an ant colony with new morphologies depending on the environmental uh, conditions. So complexi complexity itself triggers self-assembly and that if enough different molecules pass a certain threshold of complexity, they begin to self-organize into new entities like uh, uh, cell membranes or artificial cell membranes that. Uh, like liposomes or lipid nanoparticles that can be used as drug delivery nanosystems. And uh, I'd like to share with you a short video which presents the self-assembly process. Here we can see, we can see uh, phospholipids. All we know that phospholipids are the main components of our cell membranes. So uh, phospholipid 
is composed of a polar head group and a hydrophobic tail. And um, by dissolving such molecules into aqueous media, uh, such molecules come close to each other and produce uh, nanodomains that are similar to the lipid bilayers of our cell membranes. Finally, uh, uh, all these uh, components uh, uh, produce a nanostructure with a lipophilic part and hydrophilic core that can accommodate bioactive molecules like drugs or proteins or peptides, even uh, uh, RNA and genetic materials. So it's an amazing process, the self-assembly process is an amazing process that uh, uh, give us the ability to organize structures that can be used as drug delivery systems at nanoscale. In order to understand and show how the complexity of the system is impacted by the complexity of its environment, three layers of complexity are defined. The first one is the internal complexity of the system. The second one is the environmental complexity, meaning that uh, the environmental conditions affect uh, the complexity of the environment. And the third one is the interface complexity, which is defined at the interface of the system and its environment. So you have three layers of complexity, and the metrics could be functions and variables, but we have to take into consideration that thermodynamics is an amazing approach that uh, we have to use. For example, thermodynamic entropy based on uh, Boltzmann-Gibbs entropy, and entropy von Neumann corresponds to quantum entropy, and Shannon entropy corresponds to information entropy. All these entropic uh, uh, axes are very important in order to quantify the complexity, the, uh, to, to identify uh, uh, the parameters of uh, a complex system. All we know that nature is complex and is related to the morphology of the biological entities and the role of, mor of morphology is very important in order to develop new entities to be used as drug delivery system. And Pythagoras of Samos was an Ionian Greek philosopher referred to the complex systems and in the universe harmony and their relations with the human being. Uh, we know that uh, proteins belong to complex system. Protein is composed of uh, amino acids, the sequence and the conformational properties affect uh, the functionality and the complexity. And finally, the interactions with uh, epitopes, biological epitopes of, uh, uh, on our cell membrane. So proteins, like spike protein of uh, SARS-CoV-2, is, uh, is a complex system. And in uh, our lab, in, in the labs, uh, let's say, we can produce artificial complex systems like uh, uh, dendrimers or nanohorns, and you can see here uh, photos uh, cam came from my lab, and uh, uh, here are nanohorns, uh, a part of uh, fourth generation of polymers, and you can see nicely the internal complexity and the cavity of such structures that can accommodate bioactive molecules, meaning drugs or peptides or whatever. So you can see the internal complexity of such uh, systems. Nanoparticles composed of amphiphilic molecules, and uh, you can see in this light uh, um, uh, an artificial complex biosystem which is composed of uh, uh, phospholipids and uh, that produce a lipid bilayer, and uh, uh, such self-assembled nanostructure can accommodate bioactive molecules. The red spot is, for example, a drug or a bioactive molecule that can incorporate into the interior part in the aqueous uh, uh, core of this uh, structure or can interact with the surface of uh, such structure by using uh, electrostatic interactions. And uh, uh, this image uh, came from uh, my lab. Uh, 
uh, we used cryo transmission electron microscopy in collaboration with uh, external um, uh, colleagues in order to, uh, to, to, to have the morphological characteristics of such uh, structures. And what you can see, you can see the complexity of such structures, the internal complexity, uh, which is composed of channels that can accommodate water or peptides or proteins and whatever, and you can see the diversity regarding the external morphological characteristics of such nanostructure. All the structures are similar to those used for vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. So it is very important to, to understand uh, the complexity and how we can proceed uh, with a so complex system in order to produce vaccines or uh, advanced therapeutic medicinal products and not uh, absolutely drugs. Here is another nanotechnological platform which is composed of uh, glycerol, monolate, oleic acid, and pluronic. Pluronic is an amphiphilic molecule which is used to stabilize the structure. And we can see here an, another uh, nice uh, photo which presents uh, different kinds of nanoparticles like polymerosomes, liosomes, cubic. Uh, liquid crystals, cubosome, and so on. And uh, this is uh, um, an image from a recently published paper for my lab uh, with uh, using uh, uh, cryotransmission electron microscopy. And um, you can see uh, structures that can accommodate uh, mRNA or uh, RNAs or genetic material. All these morphologies depend on the nature of biomaterials that we use in order to produce such uh, morphologies, changes the complexity, and we can use such structures in order to develop lipid nanoparticles that can accommodate uh, genetic materials to be used as vaccines or uh, as uh, uh, advanced therapeutic medicinal products. Complex systems that are composed of different biomaterials can produce, as I mentioned, different nanodevices. The image here represents a polymer and a deep block polymer. All we know that a polymer is composed of monomers. A deep block polymer and their conformations and changes due to the external stimuli, due, because the external complexity, meaning the pH, the ionic strength, the temperature, can change the conformational properties of a, 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 a structure. So uh, such changes can affect the entropic stake of the structure and consequently the conformational properties. It is important to point out that such changes take place in nature through biopolymers such, such as proteins, peptides, that are stimuli responsive um, uh, products. According to the literature, Lammer states that natural processes are so beautiful that they could be considered art rather than smart achievements of science that mimics biological processes. The beauty of nature and its processes are the highest art form due to the complexity of the natural processes that lead the beauty. And finally, complexity leads beauty and art at the natural processes. The most important thing, in my view, is the internal complexity of such structure. We have the external complexity which corresponds to the long-range order and the internal complexity of such structure. Imagine a, a, a vaccine uh, which is composed of nanoparticles and uh, we have the external complexity and the internal complexity. The internal complexity is very serious because depending on the internal complexity, we can accommodate, we can encapsulate mRNA or siRNA or genetic material efficiently or not. So the internal complexity is very serious. And what you can see in this slide, you can see three cubes, A, B, C. So the A, B, C have the same external complexity, long range order, but they have different internal complexities. So if one industry produces the, the A and the other one produces B, 
they have both cubic structure, but they have different internal complexity, which affects, for example, the release profile of the encapsulated drug. The, the, it, can, it can affect the, the stability of the system, the interaction with plasma proteins, and so on. So the internal complexity is very important. And here is an amazing paper which presents liquid crystals, which are complex systems, and what we can see here, you can see that by using, by using uh, uh, important techniques, high-tech techniques, for example, SACS and high-resolution fixed fraction electron microscopy, you can take uh, 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 different <coughs> lattices A and B, which uh, we can see by using uh, 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 the, the appropriate uh, graphs. And in the first one, you can see three peaks. Each one corresponds to a different internal morphology. So what we can uh, learn about uh, um, by using such uh, techniques, uh, XRD and uh, freeze fraction electron microscopy, all these techniques allowed us to detect uh, metastable intermediate coexisting structures. The most important thing is to have coexisting structures. And uh, this internal morphology is very serious and affect uh, the in incorporation and the stability of the incorporated molecule. How shall you combine complexity with nanostructures and uh, nanotechnology? I, I would like to remind you that we have three main, three main types of medicines. The first one is the small molecules. Small molecules, for example, acetylsalicylic acid, ibuprofen, etc., uh, with a, a low molecular mass, with well-defined structures, with stability, mostly non-immunogenic, and uh, we can produce uh, copies, the well-known generic products. On the other hand, we have biologist and uh, non-biological complex drugs, better say medicines. Uh, such, uh, such, such medicinal products have high molecular mass. They are complex, heterogeneous. There are many options due to their complexity, mostly immunogenic. The, 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 mainly, uh, it is impossible to ensure identical copy versions of biological products or nano, non-biological products. There are many types of nanosystems that are already used in therapeutics, like liposomes, polymeric micelles, nanogels in therapeutics and in imaging or uh, monitoring and diagnosis. And all these uh, structures can increase the solubility of insoluble drugs in water by incorporating them into their aqueous core, into the lipophilic part. They can increase the targeting process, reduce toxicity, control the release profile, and uh, have stealth properties. So, uh, okay, uh, let's say some words regarding vaccines. Vaccines are important, uh, uh, important uh, structures, let's say, that uh, uh, we are uh, using now, and the difference between uh, liposomes and lipid nanoparticles. Lipid nanoparticles have internal complexity which facilitate the encapsulation of uh, uh, mRNA or genetic material, so it is better to use such complex structures instead of simple structures like liposomes. Virosomes uh, uh, are vaccines that can carry on their surface essential virus proteins, for example, uh, regarding the influenza virus, hematoglutinin and neuraminidase can uh, interact with the surface of lipid bilayers and uh, act as vaccines. Recently, we have published a paper in the Proceedings of European Academy of Science and Art discussing the complexity and evolution of viruses. And what do we, we state? That uh, viruses are complex system and its evolution and mutation must be observed under the lens of non-linearity as they are far from the equilibrium conditions. And various attacks on the level of information. So it is important to keep in mind that there is another path, another way 
to fight uh, diseases by using thermodynamics, biophysics, and the information theory. Without all these structures, there would be no mRNA vaccines against COVID-19, and pharmaceutical and technology is an excellent field, field for developing innovative health products. In my view, we have two main directions. The first one is the genetic approach, and the other one is uh, nanotechnology, which can produce carriers for delivering such uh, uh, compounds like genetic material. And uh, moving one step for forward, uh, the artificial intelligence is an amazing tool in order to understand the internal complexity and to design accurate internal complexities of such complex systems. And uh, moving to the end, art and beauty at nanoscale. In my view, most of novel bio nanomaterials and structures are art rather than smart because they generally are highly complex formulations difficult to synthesize and scale up in a controllable and reproducible manner. Gustav Menger, this is the last, oh. this is the last slide. Gustav Menger was a German artist and political activist who developed the concept of auto-destructive auto art and the art strike. He initiated the destructive in art symposium in 1966, what we can see from this, uh, of these slides. We can see paintings that are composed of uh, uh, liquid crystals with a different uh, size, meaning that they scatter the light, the visible light, in a different manner. So by changing the external conditions, the environmental conditions like uh, light or temperature, we change the conditions of the internal complexity of liquid crystals, resulting new painting outcome. So the complexity, the interface complexity, is the driving force for the final art outcome. And the imaginary landscapes of beauty and complexity based on dendritic nanostructure, I mentioned that uh, Dendrimers are the first generation of polymers that are used to produce nanostructures and to transport bioactive molecules by the artist uh, Angela Frangu. And finally, I would like to, to, to thank you for your kind attention, but uh, uh, before I would like to thank Professor George Krusos, uh, who kindly wrote the foreword of my book, uh, and I'm a very grateful Professor Krusos for this, uh, the Voice of Science, The Silence of Nature, which uh, uh, deals with a conversation between the physical and biological laws in microcosmos and macrocosmos and presents the interfacial phenomena between the complex micro, macro, and mega cosmos that we are living. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, too. We will proceed. Uh, the next speech uh, will be given f uh, from uh, Dr. George Crusoe. He's a pedi pediatrician and endocrinologist and one of the most uh, world's foremost uh, medical clinical researchers. He is a professor emeritus at the National uh, and Capodistrian University of Athens. And uh, also, uh, he, has, he, he is a director of University Research Institute of Maternal and Child Health and Prevention Medicine. Thank you very much. The podium is yours. Uh, professor, thank you very much for your invitation. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, it's, I think it's a, either the third or the fourth time. Um, today I'm going to talk about genetics, epigenetics, and culture, and how between themselves they form a virtuous cycle. Let me say a few words about evolution and development. Evolution concerns the species, development concerns the individual. And therefore, evolution corresponds to phylogeny, 
and to genetics, whereas development corresponds to our ontogeny and our epigenetics. So we're talking about the evo divo field. You see it mentioned this way. Now, stress is involved in our evolution and our development. And what is it? It's the state of threatened or disturbed homeostasis of any complex system. Now, how about culture? Culture is the totality of the behavioral environment in a group of social beings. So in a sense, humanity has human civilization. That's culture. Now, this lecture has the following four parts. Number one, I'll say a few words about complex systems, stress concepts, and human uniqueness. Number two, evolution. Number three, evolutionary and developmental stressors in just one slide. And finally, the relationship between stress, evo divo, and culture. Now, in the Western world, the first person to speak about complex system was Pythagoras. He said that the universe is a complex system and it's in constant balance, which he called it harmony, harmonious balance. On one side, there are disturbing forces. On the other side, there are uh, counteracting, reestablishing forces, so adaptive responses. He has a student who was a physician, Alcmeon, and he said the same is true for humans. Humans are complex systems, and he used the term isonomia to express harmony. And on one side is stressors, on the other side is the adaptive response. After him, we had Hippocrates, who talked about eucrasia versus dyscrasia, because at the time they believed in the theory of humors. Then, about 100 years later, Epicurus talked about eustathia, ecstasis, and finally, 2,300 years later, Walter Cannon uh, re found again the same concept that was expressed 2,000 years before him, and he called it homeostasis. Well, as you can see, these are all Greek words. So this is the best definition of uh, homeostasis, eustathia, which is the balanced state of the flesh and the soul. Now, we have another major person in the ancient world that talked about complex systems, and that was Aristotle. And he talked about virtues as complex systems. So he said that the good is between two evils, and the evils are either too much or too little. And here is the Aristotle curve, which is pertinent to all homeostatic systems in our body. In the middle, we have eustasis, eustathia. On the two sides, we have allostasis or cacostasis, either deficiency on one side or excess on the other. Now, interestingly, if we stay with this, within this comfortable range, we're talking about eustress, good stress. And we actually need it. We need this property of this state of eustress. And um, therefore, Hans Selye made this definition. He said, there is eustress, which is good for you, and there is bad stress or distress, which is bad for you. And uh, here we come to a pharmacological term of hormesis. The term hormesis comes from Greek hormesis, hormesis, which means rapid motion or eagerness, in itself from the ancient Greek hormine, therefore hormones, to set in motion, to impel, or to urge on. And in fact, human beings have a certain property. They constantly have the tendency to control their environment. And that is, has been called by psychologists effectance. I have found no good term in Greek for effectance. It's a tendency to do things. Um, learning is a form of effectance because you master something, you learn something new, and um, 
Conatus is a term that was used by Spinoza to mean exactly the same thing. Conatus means the internal tendency of human beings to do things. Therefore, the good thing is hormetic stress, which is within this range. Insufficient stress is bad for us. Excess stress is bad for us. Now, why are we talking about complex systems? A human cell is extremely complex. We consist of about 10 trillion cells, and each cell has its DNA in the chromosomes. That's 6 billion bases. Uh, only 2% of that DNA is expressed in protein, but there are 20,000 protein coding genes, and there are 24,000 non-coding RNA coding genes. And what do these RNAs do? They're mostly regulatory. In a one little human cell, in the DNA, we have over one million sequences that are important for regulation. The other thing that's very complex in humans is the brain. We have 100 billion neurons and uh, over 10 to the 17th power synapses. Uh, that's 10 times, 10,000 times more synapses in a human brain than stars in our universe. What's been happening in the world since the beginning, since the Big Bang? Entropy has been going down. It's a law of nature, let's call it. It's called negentropy. What does it mean? It means that there is a continuous tendency for information density to increase. And that concerns both the material world and the living world. So a, big, a little summary. Humans are of unique complexity in the known universe. Uh, complex systems are in a dynamic disequilibrium that requires energy to be sustained. So if we don't eat, uh, we die. And despite this huge complexity, complex systems have organizing principles and follow mathematic rules. Therefore, we can understand them, analyze them, and understand them. That's why nowadays we're talking about systems biology and systems medicine. Now, our Cells as a complex system who are in a baseline uh, homeostasis, like here. Something happens that stresses us. We lose that homeostasis, but then we have the adaptive response that usually brings us back to the previous homeostasis. So that's fine for us. Doesn't mean anything. If anything, it's good. On the other hand, however, there are other situations where we don't come back to our previous homeostasis. And we are in a continuous distress, bad state that damages us, we feel bad, and we live less. That's called cacostasis. And then a few times we can learn from stress and do things that improve our body and brain. And in this situation, we are in an improved balance or equilibrium, improve homeostasis, which means that if something happens to us, we have resilience, we are resilient. It's psychosomatic resilience, which means ataraxia of the soul and aponia of the body. Now, whenever we exceed a certain stress uh, level, we activate our stress system, which means we activate the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, produce cortisol, and we activate the, reward, the uh, arousal system of the brain, it's called locus ceruleus, or LC, uh, and we activate the uh, autonomic nervous system. In a, in primarily, we activate the sympathetic system and we deactivate the parasympathetic system. So in the brain, we have CRH and vasopressin in the hypothalamus and norepinephrine in the brain stem in the back. And in the periphery, we have cortisol, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and immune CRH, which is CRH secreted by the uh, 
nervous system by the postganglionic neurons of the sympathetic system. And then norepinephrine and epinephrine together, they stimulate the production of interleukin-6, which is an inflammatory cytokine. And it's endocrine that circulates in the blood. So you can see that whenever we're stressed, we activate the system, which is actually, it's a system that communicates those two centers with each other. And um, in the end, we produce cortisol, norepinephrine, epinephrine, IL-6, and immune CRHs. Immune CRHs degranulates mast cells, and all of these hormones influence the immune system and the inflammatory reaction. Now, we have two types of stress, acute and chronic stress. Acute is a very well-known fight, flight, freeze reaction, the three Fs. It's quick, we either survive or we don't survive, and that's it. Usually it doesn't uh, produce any damage unless it's extreme. On the other hand, chronic stress, which is the modern stress of today's society, it's chronic psychosocial economic stress, which is mild or moderate. It's not very high, but it's constant. And when that happens, then we have chronically activated fight, flight, and freeze reaction. Fight means anger. Flight means fear. And freeze means paralysis. We don't do anything. Depression. And at the same time, because of the cytokines at all that are secreted, we have chronic smoldering inflammation. And of course, the hormones that I told you produce pathology. So generally, chronic unrelenting stress is damaging, and it's called distress, chronic distress. Now, what are the hormones that damage our brain and body? They are the catecholamines, CRH, cortisol, and the rookin 6 and interleukin-6 and other inflammatory mediators. Now, let me tell you about a very important system that we have in our brain, which is called the default mode network. That burns 10% of the body energy, and which means half of the energy of the brain. It works day and night. And in this system, we have our self, awareness and our autobiography, our past, our present, and we can imagine our future. So that's an important system uh, that deals with our own selves. Now, the brain consists of multiple networks. I would say each network is almost like an organ in the body, and these networks communicate with each other. That's called connectivity, inter-network connectivity. So there are nerve fibers, white substance, that connect the various parts of the brain. And whenever we're thinking of something or doing something, we have multiple changes. But I'm going to talk about primarily stress. What happens when you activate the stress system? Well, number one, you activate the center of fight, flight, and freeze reaction, which is the amygdala of the brain and other parts of the brain. All of these together are called the saline system. So your stress, you activate part of the brain, the saline network. When that happens, the saline network does two things. One, it inhibits the default mode network, so we stop thinking about ourselves, and does two things to the executive network, the network that makes the decision and will lead us to take an act or not take an act. And it's interesting. For about 300 milliseconds, which is less that we can feel, it suppresses the uh, network, the executive network. But then, after that, it stimulates it. And the idea is that perhaps there is strategy that is being developed and then uh, with the activation the act uh, takes place. Now what does the executive network do which is in the front of the brain primarily the frontal lobe? It interprets the environment 
especially social cues. It solves problems, it plans for the future, it controls our feelings, so it's emotional autoregulation, and it's important for our morality, our moral decisions. Now, very importantly, the stress hormones, as well as the sex steroids and some cytokines, influence the brain in a major fashion when stress occurs, either in utero or in the first five years of life, or later on in puberty. These are three periods that are critical in our lives. Why? Because these hormones can have long-term effects. And because the brain, the human brain, is really formed in the first five years, the result of uh, stressing such a brain of a child can have uh, dour uh, results later on in that child's life. Now, let me go and say a few words about evolution. Our universe was formed about 14 billion years ago. Then we have the formation of the cyanobacteria that did the photosynthesis, oxygen. Um, then, about half a billion years ago, we have the formation of the first multicellular organisms. And then 60 million years ago, we have the formation of the primates. And about the last 200,000 years, we have the modern Homo sapiens. So here is the uh, evolution as it occurs. And you can see primates. And where are primates? It's right here. Now, are there any relationship between the DNA of a chimpanzee and the DNA of a human? Yes, there is about 97% similarity. However, we're totally different from the chimpanzees. A few years ago, a scientist uh, compared the genes of the chimpanzee and the genes of, the, of a human, and they found about 250 areas in the DNA, which they call the highly accelerated regions. These are genes, apparently, that played major role in the transformation of the chimpanzee, or the, the ancestor, which, when, when we separated from the chimpanzee, uh, which is called, which are basically mostly regulatory, non-coding areas, and some transcription factors. So here we have our common ancestor about six to eight million years ago, and here is chimpanzee, and here is the human. Human brain, 1.3 kilograms. As I said, the brain has multiple organs inside it. We call them networks, but it doesn't matter. And here is the formation of the human brain, starting with a brain that was similar to that of the chimpanzee, which is 380 grams and 18 billion neurons, to about 13 or 1400 grams and 100 billion neurons. And beyond the size and the number, we have uh, new specific neurons for humans that are specialized and they're very rapid. And also, there are some neurons in large numbers that are contained in all social beings, but in humans, are, the numbers are much higher, that are called spindle neurons, or von Economo social neurons. And here is the human brain properties, that the properties that characterize us as humans. Well, if you look one by one, these properties exist in the chimpanzee and other earlier beings, but at much, much, much uh, quantitatively lower, smaller number. That's a smaller quantity. And I won't, since we don't have a lot of time, I'll just tell you that these, uh, these they are, and if you want, we, we can give them to you. I can give you the lecture. Now, here is the development of humans starting the separation from the chimps. It seems that there are about three genes, there are more, but there are three that play a major role in the 
quantitatively for the size of the brain. And here is the duplication of this gene here, which is actually a mitochondrial gene. And the second, the duplicate gene, this uh, duplicated about five million years ago. And the duplicate gene here changed uh, and it became a growth factor for the cortex, the human cortex. And the brain went from uh, 380 grams to about 900 grams. And then gradually, over two million years, it became 1,300 grams approximately for Homo sapiens and about 1,600 grams for Neanderthals and uh, Denisovan people. Then there is another gene here, uh, which uh, separates us apparently from uh, the Neanderthal, which plays a role also in the growth of the uh, frontal lobe. And recently they published in Science, going, uh, doing biocomputing uh, bio analysis based on the genome, and they suggested that about 800 thousand years ago, before we separated from Neanderthal and Denisova, the human ancestor, they call him the ancestor X, um, went down to 1,200 people. And we're all descendants of these 1,200 people. So that was called a near extinction bottleneck. And of course, it played a major role on how we developed uh, after that. And here is the common ancestor. They've called that ancestor Homo heidelbergensis, ο άνθρωπος Heidelbergis. Και αυτός έδωσε και τον μοντέρνο άνθρωπο, ο οποίος ξεκίνησε από την Αφρική. And here is uh, Neanderthal and then uh, Dennis Owen. And there we found mixture of all three of these uh, species. But primarily the species that survive with a little percentage of the other species genes uh, is the uh, modern human, us. So here are the timeline of major events on, of how we separated and eventually we reached the point where billions of people are connected with these social networks. That's uh, new for humanity, okay? We, we go up to 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, but now, we're talking billions. And of course, the children now are expressed to the internet, and we have the so-called generation I, or iGen, and they develop totally differently from us. And uh, people are collecting information, and uh, soon we're gonna have very interesting uh, results, and we're gonna have to make some major decisions on what we're gonna do with uh, acculturation of our children. Now, there are many ways to go to the past, and actually there is right now in the Benaki Museum a fantastic uh, exhibition of prehistoric art, where they have art from people before we separated, before our common ancestors started becoming hum human or Neanderthal or Denisova. And, uh, we found art produced by the Neanderthals. They could also draw. Now, we are formed by culture and we're dependent on culture, and we cannot survive without it. It's very hard for one human being to live alone. And uh, because of our culture, we have the longest known uh, percentage of time spent in childhood, because basically our brain is completed at the age of 25 to 27 years. So it takes us one third to one fourth of our life to learn and become part of the human culture, human civilization. I'll go fast. Actually, you're gonna see some of these uh, they started sculpting on these uh, hand axes. They, call they make sculptures on them to make them beautiful. Before 
let's say two or three million years ago it started. And here are what happened in the last from 280,000 years to now, the various properties that we obtained over time. And uh, making complete images is one of the last ones. Now let me give you in one slide the evolutionary developmental stressors. These are starvation, extremely stre stressful for us, dehydration, injurious agents, inflammatory or non-inflammatory, adversaries, enemies, protection for tissue injury, and social bonding or cultural and technological development. If you disturb any of these, you're going to have a problem. But interestingly, we're very good in protecting these properties. In other words, we conserve energy. That's why we have a lot of obesity and metabolic syndrome. We conserve water and electrolytes, hypertension. We are very good in fighting uh, microbes, and etc viruses, and um, this can become autoimmunity and allergy. Uh, we're very good in anticipating enemies and minimizing exposure. So anxiety, uh, uh, depression, withdrawal. We're very good about protecting our tissues from injury. We have fatigue and pain, and finally, we are good about retaining our uh, social integrity. So let me now go and talk about stress, evo, devo, and culture. What's epigenetics? Epigenetics, if we have a computer and that's the hardware, the epigenetics is the software. And the product of the computer, the text or anything, is the phenotype. So. Here is how we develop, how we uh, believe that a human being is formed. We're formed by genetics, our genetic background, by our environment, and by our epigenetics. So lifestyle is important, and we have environment-derived epigenetics, some of which are heritable, okay? They can be retained three, four, five generations. We have stochastic epigenetics, which are important for tissue differentiation over time. We have metastable epigenetics because half of our genome consists of retroviruses, incomplete. About 25,000 of them have the ability to be transposed from one part of the DNA to another. And uh, for that, we have epigenetics of suppression of these uh, retroviruses. I think you recognize the double helix, and what you see, the two little things you see here, two little balls, are methyl groups. Without methyl groups or with methyl groups, it's a totally different molecule. So it's recognized by different proteins, and different agents, and here is cytosine methylated into five methyl cytosine. It's a very important part of epigenetics. And then the other important part is here, as you see, the DNA is uh, folded around the nucleosome. These are the histones. And you see these little tails? These are lysins. And lysins have an amino group at the end, which can be esterified, can be acetylated, methylated, et cetera, et cetera. So here you see lysine, okay, and acetyllysin. The acetyl group is very negative. So if you add acetyl groups to the histones, they push the DNA away, which is also negative in charge. So this way, proteins can come and uh, influence it. And here are all the forms of inheritance that we know nowadays. It's our DNA, the blueprint of our blueprint, uh, our structural uh, integrity. We need some initial part of a membrane for it to be uh, inherited. Steady state is also inherited, inherited. Epigenetic, which I just mentioned. And of course, we have behavioral or symbolic 
uh, forms of inheritance, and culture. Culture, which is huge in our case, humans, uh, is inherited symbolically. We, the way we uh, deal with our children. So they have, we have all these components of epigenetics, and um, I just said methylation, but there are all kinds of esterifications that can occur. And um, there are methyl CPG binding <coughs> proteins, and there are chromatin compacting or unwinding complexes, um, uh, like polycomb, which is suppressive, and uh, trithorax, which is uh, stimulatory. And basically, epigenetics, eventually, uh, you can bring it down to writers or highlighters, right? Methylation, for example, acetylation. Erasers, demethylation, deacetylation. Readers or decoders, DNA binding proteins, the complexes I told you about. And finally, some facilitators that are important for epigenetics. And we have diseases that concern all of these uh, uh, epigenetics. Of course, the, uh, when a gene is activated, uh, it's unfolding, it's unwinding. And um, here you see that when the DNA is replicated, uh, it is able to maintain its methylations, the methylome. So something happens, and this occurs in a very accurate way. Um, here is a transcription. Uh, coactivator complex is a co-repressor. We know the components of these complexes. And for example, the glucocorticoid receptor, uh, that's how it works, either to stimulate or to inhibit the um, transcription of a gene. And here are all the epigenetic functions that we know of, but my, I kept connect, collect, collecting them as, as they were published, but I think now, I think there is no function in a human being, no biological function that doesn't have an epigenetic component. The last one uh, that was described was hard memory. That also has an epigenetic component. This is the tissue differentiation you can see here, right? You can start from a, from a embryonic stem cell. You add retinoic acid, becomes a Neuro, neuron precursor, you add nothing and it becomes a neuron, you add these two proteins, it becomes an astrocyte, and you add this and it becomes an, an oligodendrocyte. Uh, so you can produce many tissues um, through epigenetic uh, processes. And um, we have about 100 genes in the human that are uh, imprinted. In other words, we express either our father's or our mother's uh, gene. And um, for these genes to, for, to have a normal individual, one gene has to be from the father, one from the mother. Two from the mother, you get a problem. Two from the father, you get a problem. And we have all of these uh, genetic syndromes uh, that are associated with, it, with big size or with small size. And this is the totality. There are about 12 uh, epigenetic imprinting syndromes. The, we have 100 genes. I think there are more, uh, Dr. Adonarakis, there are more uh, syndromes to be uh, discovered. And uh, I think I'm going to show this and then leave you alone. Um, a very important stress-related epigenetic process has to do with the activity of the glucocorticoids. And the glucocorticoids work through their receptor. 20% of our genome are affected by glucocorticoids. So when we're stressed, some genes are activated, some genes are suppressed. The interesting thing is that if we're stressed early in life, in utero, first five years, and later on in puberty, some of the epigenetic changes that concern this system are permanent. And which are those? It has to deal, they have to deal with a glucorticoid negative feedback. 
So if you stress an animal, that animal later on will be easily stressed and will have problems from overactivation of the stress system. Okay, so we try not to stress our children a lot so that we, they develop normally. And uh, here is the process, and I'll finish with this slide. Uh, this is a mouse that's been treated well by its mother, or a human, doesn't matter, a monkey. It produces serotonin and dopamine. Uh, that activates this histone acetyl transferase. The acetyl group go and acetylate the uh, histones of the glucorticoid receptor gene, which means that the DNA is being pushed away. And then the demethylases come in and demethylate the gene. When the gene is demethylated, uh, it's expressed very well in the feedback centers like the hippocampus in the brain, and the animal will be a normal animal later on. The opposite will be an animal that's stressed and has peculiar behaviors. And I put these Greek words here because I think it's interesting. Titha in ancient Greek means tili. Okay, titha, like tit in English, the same root. And um, the verb tithasevo or tithasevmenos, atithasos, means the person who saw the titha is the person who is good, behaves well and so forth. The atithasos is the opposite. And somehow they knew it, I don't know how. But it's interesting. It's wisdom that's coming from the distant uh, part, past. And this is an example here of transmission of obesity and metabolic syndrome through either three or two generations. And now, for example, with the COVID, we expect that the next two, three, even four generations of individuals will be affected because they will have changes uh, in their genome, epigenetic, early in life, that will stay there. I think I'll stop here because I already took too much time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we will have a 10 minute uh, break and uh, come back with the next session of neurology.